Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. I'm joined again by my co-host, Leila Yari, and we have a very special guest here today, Angela Rastigar. Did I say that right, Angela Rastigar? Perfect. Rastigar, perfect. The co-founder and CEO of Sunfish. How are you today? I'm really excited to be here, Jared. We're excited to have you. Uh, let's let's dive in. I guess, uh, Layla, you want to kick things off, and we'll have Angela start telling us some uh, some cool stuff. Angela, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. We're so excited to have you, especially since you're a longtime friend of mine, and I've watched you through the Sunfish journey, and I'm an investor in the company. And we'll just go ahead and jump right in. Um, we want to know about your background, what inspired you to start Sunfish. So please share with us. Thank you so much for having me. So a little bit about my background. Most recently, I was working as a director at Circle Surrogacy, which is one of the largest surrogacy agencies and actually one of the largest fertility and in, in, um, companies in the world. And while I was there, I worked with thousands of aspiring parents who are trying to pursue building their family through alternative pathways, through assisted reproduction. And the financial component of building their families through surrogacy, through IVF, through egg donors was really devastating to watch. I saw people cry to me on the phone about how they couldn't afford building their family. Um, and there really weren't any great solutions to help people navigate the financial side of this incredibly fast growing market. So we now know the fertility industry is growing um, faster than almost any other industry. We were seeing multiple billions of dollars in TAM added every single year. And as I thought about how I wanted to help these families really achieve their dreams of becoming parents, the idea for Sunfish came to light. And we started the company less than two years ago, last year, and we've seen tremendous growth. So I'm excited to share a little bit more about how we help people build their families, the products we offer, and where I see the market going. This is awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, I really love the name of your company, and um, I'd love for you to just actually share with us what drove you to call it Sunfish. It's a really cute story. Thank you. So Sunfish, the ocean sunfish, are actually one of the most fertile animals on the planet. And I originally grew up in Hawaii, where the ocean sunfish are called mola mola, and they're really special, kind of peaceful, um, low stress seeming animals. So it was really a lot about the way in which I wanted our customers to feel just coasting through warm waters and making their journeys a little bit easier. Amazing. Um, can you share just like high level, like how does it work? Like if I want to use sunfish, can you kind of walk me through that? Yeah, absolutely. So Sunfish offers two main things right now. The first is to help people financially plan and access resources for building their family through assisted reproduction. So if you're starting your family with IVF or surrogacy, the average cost is in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is a lot for most Americans. And so we offer an entire guided set of tools, including a human financial advocate that will work with folks going through this process to help them access loans, discounts, resources, and financial planning tools. And then the second thing that we offer, which is our newer product, is an IVF success program, which helps people de-risk the process of going through IVF. And that's where we're bringing in a lot of innovative predictive analytics, machine learning, eventually AI, to help people calculate with their unique bio data the exact cost that it will take them to get pregnant through IVF. Um, and we offer guidance and a membership through that, which is really unique. And it's just right now being launched at a few of our early partner clinics. So all in, a lot of resources to help people navigate the journey of paying for assisted reproduction um, and figuring out how to be best financially positioned as their households and families grow and as they become parents. Amazing. And there's one term that we see a lot called assisted reproduction. Can you sort of speak a little bit on the definition of that? Yeah, great question. So assisted reproduction or ART, A-R-T as, as it's often referred to, is all of the technologies that are used to help people build their families, anything from IVF, IUI, surrogacy, egg donation, really anything outside of just the traditional birds and bees that you might imagine, um, aka 
the natural way, as people might say. Um, and so one of the reasons that I like to use that term is when we refer to the word fertility, that can be exclusionary to the queer community or to people that are building their families using these technologies, not because they necessarily have issues with their own fertility. You could have two um, men who are in a same-sex male couple who are both technically fertile, but they need assisted reproduction to build their family. So it is a more inclusive term that many of us in the industry prefer to use. That's an interesting way of putting it. I didn't even think like, because th typically, so you could have two people, they they would never have any issues uh, having children. But th so that that term, Layla, that term makes a, when we, we were talking about it, we, we thought it was a, a cool term, but thank you for providing yeah. the additional information behind it. Angela, can you dig a little bit deeper into the, the why behind Sunfish as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I could talk about this all day. So I have actually founded a few other companies before. And um, while I was working at the surrogacy agency, I, I know firsthand how hard it is to build a business. I know you have a ton of founders on here that talk about that on the pod. Um, I really, truly wanted traditional financial tools, banks, um, providers who are supporting people with financial planning to offer something that I thought would be really great for my customers, for our intended parents going through this process. And I just could not find anything out there that was really bringing the level of complexity, the empathy and care that's needed for such a big financial decision, as well as the right financial tools to the market. And so knowing full well how difficult the founder journey is, I decided to jump in anyways, because I just so strongly believed that this was a really critical pain point to solve for what is the most important purchase that people make and is increasingly becoming the first major purchase that young families make as they start their households. So we know right now that WHO just announced this year that one in six people struggle with fertility on top of that. Um, the growing LGBTQ community is increasingly turning to assisted reproduction. So this market's growing so quickly. And without these tools, I saw people making really devastating financial decisions. Things like I've had um, customers that I work with sell their engagement ring or liquidate their 401k because when you're in that point of being so desperate to become a parent, you might make a financial decision that's going to really hurt your household downstream. And so I felt like my team and I would be able to help people really find the best financial resources for them and set themselves up for success long term. So it was something that I just felt this burning need to help build and, and help people more on this journey. And most like this space is mostly cash pay. Uh, today, right? Uh, so, so that being said, what's the potential market size in the coming years? And I guess why you alluded to it a little bit and and already what you've said, but why has this been so underserved for for so long? Yeah, great question. So the technology here is pretty new. Um, the first IVF baby is only about forty years old here in the U.S., and it's really only since twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen when many of these technologies were deemed non-experimental um, and were classified slightly differently by different medical communities here in the U.S. that they started to take root and really grow. So as of a few years ago, the fertility industry in the U.S. was only about $8 billion, but we project there's several different types of um, customers, of users of fertility treatments that could see exponential growth in this market. And I'll just talk through what those five big groups are. First, obviously, infertility, people struggling with just getting pregnant in the first place. Second are, um, and that's about one in six couples. Second is habitual miscarriage. So people who have ongoing miscarriages and can't keep a pregnancy, that's only about 2% of the market, but a big portion of the population in terms of numbers. Third are people who are carriers of pre-existing genetic diseases. And our technology now actually allows you to screen those embryos out. So if you don't wanna, for example, pass a high risk of breast cancer onto your kids, you can actually elect to do that. Um, 
So that's about 6% of the U.S. population. And then there's this growing group of LGBTQ, same-sex families that today is about 9% of the population that could grow as well. And lastly, oncofertility or cancer survivors, people who want to set aside their biology, their sperm and eggs before going through treatment, which gets damaged during cancer treatment so that they can be biological parents down the road. So we estimate that if all of those populations actually had access to treatments, the to fertility and assisted reproduction, the total market size would be over a trillion dollars a year. And just to put that in context, I know here in the U.S., a lot of people seem to know folks that are going through fertility treatments. We still only see about 1% of babies in the U.S. being born through these technologies. But in countries like Denmark, where there is more financial access, about 10% of the population is born through assisted reproductive means. So we have the opportunity in the U.S. just by increasing financial access alone to 10x the size of this market. And there's so many, as I talked to you through those five examples, there's so many different types of people that these technologies can really help. Angela, um, so who are you partnering with today? Like, how are you getting the word out? Like, are there any big partnerships that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Sunfish right now is primarily B2B2C. So I talked at a high level about some of the solutions we offer. Typically, people will find out about us through their doctor or through their fertility clinic. Um, and we'll offer those different solutions that I mentioned. It's a really easy to use process. You put in your information, we'll connect you with loans. We offer up to $100,000 through our platform with financial guidance or with that IVF success program, which is really revolutionary and new and uses kind of cutting edge machine learning to develop. Um, people can also come directly to our website and we've actually had the opportunity to work with patients now in almost every state. We've worked with patients in 48 states around the U.S. So it's pretty easy to find us um, either directly or through your medical provider. We work with surrogacy agencies, egg donor agencies, infertility community groups, queer community groups, um, and a bunch of the medical community as well. One of the things I, I really wanted to ask you, Angela, is some of my favorite questions are around the tech whenever we have guests on, right? So, and usually lately it's been AI machine learning related uh, just, just because those have been the hottest topics. So Sunfish uses machine learning um, to estimate a couple's unique chance of success, right? So cool. Um, and that's really shifting towards outcomes-based care, which, which is definitely a huge shift. But how did you develop these tools is what, is what I would love to hear. And what else is needed to you know, continue moving forward and, and, and doing what you're doing? That is a great question. Yeah, call, thanks for calling that out. I'm really proud of the work that our team has done there. We have an incredible group of folks who have backgrounds in insure tech, um, machine learning, data science, as well as a really incredible medical advisory board that have all worked together to develop that process. Um, it took a really long time and we had to ingest a lot of data. I think there's still a long ways to go to refine those models. One challenge that we in the fertility community face with regards to data and the shift to AI that people often talk about in my circles is that our data today has been pretty biased towards a small group of people. We talked about fertility and assisted reproduction being pretty new Historically, most of the people who've accessed these services have been wealthy and white. Um, so as we improve our models, we really want to see more ethnic diversity feeding into the model so that we can account for different patient types and improve those algorithms over time. Right now, these, these treatments do seem really expensive to people or people maybe just don't know what the cost is. And we would love to democratize access to the kind of empowerment that um, reproductive freedom can offer to people and allow people to access these treatments um, at many income levels and many economic levels with our financial guidance and support. So, yeah, definitely, for sure. And I'm so excited and proud to be an investor in the company. So thank you for including me in on your journey. <laughs> We're excited to have you on board. I have a question for you about your founder journey. Um, you're a three-time founder. 
and you're a female founder, which is awesome. We need more of you. Um, and did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur or was there a moment that kind of set you on this path? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I didn't always think about being an entrepreneur per se, but I did always feel really driven to give back to the communities that I was a part of because I felt so fortunate to have the resources that I've had. And specifically, I'm first generation American. So both my parents are foreign. They immigrated to the US before I was born. And I learned early on, probably when I was 12, 13, um, a lot of the stories that my family went through, especially when it comes to reproductive rights and economic empowerment for women. That's something that I really had the fortune of here in the US, although I guess reproductive rights seem to ebb and flow a bit here in the US nowadays as well. Um, but for That's the most part, I felt really, yeah, <laughs> I felt really fortunate to have all the resources that I had and realized that's really, really rare for a lot of the rest of the world. So um, all of the work I've done has been in the intersection of economic empowerment and reproductive rights. I spent some time working internationally um, and similarly with Sunfish, you know, that's really where I see our role. We're allowing people to own their fertility journey, to own the timeline at which they build a, their own family and to have a strong financial position as they go about some of these really um, intense and, and large family financial planning um, journeys as well. So that's always been the focus. I wouldn't say necessarily as an entrepreneur, but always been the focus and mission of my career. That's awesome. Well, we're so glad that you are, um, you know, in the game as a female founder. And as we all know, like 2% of VC money goes towards female founders. And so we're super excited that you're part of that 2%. And obviously we'd like to increase that number overall. Thank you. Well, it really takes a village and I could not be more thrilled about the team um, that we have on board working with me as well as the incredible group of investors that we have on board like you. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk just real quickly about the team. So um, you have a co-founder on board with you as well. And if you want to share anything that you want to share about your team, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah. I actually have a really incredible executive team. The leadership team comes from a combination of backgrounds, mostly in consumer lending and insure tech to really help build this frictionless user experience for our, for our borrowers and our customers, as well as folks from the fertility industry like myself. Um, and product design, um, operations have all come on board with kind of really intense, um, startup expertise as well. But most importantly, I think what draws us all together is we're all really passionate about helping to build families. And many of us have had our own personal connections to either going through assisted reproduction and fertility challenges ourselves or someone close to us. So I think that empathy and care and drive for the mission of helping to, to make babies is what really brings us all together. You rock, Angela. Um, you know, this is, this is our first time meeting. And, and one of the reasons I do like doing this on video is because we, uh, the audience that does tune in to see the video, they can see how you're, you're beaming when you're talking about the company. And um, I, I don't want to speak for Layla, but... I know like any of the investments no, it's I've, true. But, it's true, but I mean, but Angela, I've known Angela for years. She's always been beaming talking about her work and talking about the fertility <laughs> space. And, you know, and at Circle Surrogacy, she was like always so passionate about helping people become parents through surrogacy. So this is like, this is her passion. So yeah, it's, it's definitely the truth. I just think like, from an investor perspective, that's one of the biggest like check boxes when you can see like genuine enthusiasm and just that excitement and happiness to, to be building what you're building. So kudos to you and the team, Angela, and so excited for, for what you've already done. And it wouldn't be a slice of healthcare podcast if I didn't ask you this question. You know, talk five, 10 year, you know, impact. Where do you see Sunfish going in the future? Thanks, Jared. <laughs> I do love talking about Sunfish. So we have really ambitious goals for the company. Right now, we're focused on solving the financial access component of assisted reproduction. But our big vision is to really support families throughout the journey of building and growing uh, their entire household expenses. So all things financial access, financial literacy, savings, investing, 
as the kids that we help them conceive grow up and grow in the world. Um, so our big vision is to really help with financial literacy. And I want to thank you so much for having me on the pod because where we sit in the intersection of fertility and personal finances are two of the most stigmatized topics and things that people really have a lot of fear and shame and difficulty talking about. So I think it's so important to be able to have conversations like this with you and your audience to be able to let people know that this is something a lot of people are going through. A lot of people are struggling to figure out how to afford and manage the cost of this. And it's it's really, really critical to be able to share these stories so that these conversations do become a lot more mainstream. And Angela, one, one question about sort of where you see uh, cost of the service over like the next 10, 20 years, like where do you think it will be? Do you think it will continue to become more affordable overall? Like would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a great question. And one that the medical community and the assisted reproductive community debates a lot. On one hand, we have seen the average annual costs go up quite a bit from year to year, anywhere from about 7 to 15% per year, um, driven by a number of factors, um, a, a lot of fixed costs, a lot of rising demand. Um, and so I do expect that to continue in the near term. That being said, there are some kind of stepwise advancements in technology and ART, a lot of it evolving the use of AI and ro advanced robotics to scale the work that fertility doctors are able to do um, and to improve outcomes that I hope um, will bring a large de decrease in the average cost per treatment, as well as innovative work that Sunfish and other fertility startups are doing to improve access, um, things like remote monitoring, so uh, you know, which allows you to kind of do some of the pre-work outside of the fertility clinic walls. So I do think optimistically that in the coming five to 10 years, we will see prices come down, but it's a hot topic of debate in the art community. Yeah, it sounds like it. So I guess we'll end with this last question. So what are your biggest priorities for Sunfish as we head into 2024? The main thing that I really wanna see evolve both for us and for our community as a whole is destigmatizing these conversations. I wanna see people share their stories to talk about not just their fertility journey, but the cost of it and what it takes to get there. So if you're interested in sharing your story, feel free to tag us. Um, we're at Joint Sunfish on all social channels, or just let us know if there's anything we can do to help share the journey that you went on, because not all journeys look the same, but it's really important that we're talking about what it takes to achieve your dream of becoming a parent. Um, and beyond that, growing the team, helping more customers. We love getting to see baby photos at the end of people's journeys. It's really what keeps me and the rest of the team going. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. So great to have you. Thank you both. Have a great afternoon.